dear Dr. Mildner, dear Somi, dear Shelley Stewart, dear Ramesh Akbari, dear Anya Peel, dear Roy Bahan, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. On behalf of the Senate of the Free and Hanseatic City of Hamburg, I'd like to welcome you to this digital transatlantic discussion in cooperation with the Aspen Institute Germany and Microsoft in front of your screens in Germany and the United States. I am absolutely delighted that we can convene on this occasion and we're very happy to co-host this very important event and discussion. Unfortunately, the current situation doesn't quite allow me to greet you in person in our nice building here in the representation to the Federation in the heart of Berlin in Germany's capital and deepen today's topic and deepen the discussion over ideas in person. But I am very sure that this ongoing conversation will also take you one day in person to this place and I'm much looking forward to that. And we've learned over the past months how much really is possible in the digital world. And um, this workshop series is part of that. I understand it's the fourth in a series of workshops. And um, today we are all going to have a look into the policymakers toolbox. And I'm very happy to have such a distinguished panel with a wealth of experience to share in both analysis ideas, but also practical experience. And thank you very much for having us witnessing this conversation. There is a whole number of key questions, ultimately quite basic questions, but they come with a lot of detailed analysis and uh, with a lot of thinking. And I'm very happy that we have such distinguished panelists to help us do that. Just to look into a few of them, how do politics secure good work and its dignity in times of digital, transformation of automatization and artificial intelligence? How do we face the decoupling of work and productivity and the increase of income inequalities with legislative means? Just as I said, some very basic and yet key questions that policymakers have to answer and which we are going to discuss today from a number of perspectives. I think we all agree on the aim of a cooperative and humane shape of the digital transformation of work. But what does it mean and what does it take? The pandemic has changed our lives in many ways during the last year, and it has also accelerated the digital transformation of work. Not only with regard to jobs at a desk that can more easily be done by working from home. We're currently discovering a whole number of new questions and the pandemic in many ways accelerates what we have perhaps only seen emerge. And that can come as a challenge, but it can also be quite helpful because it helps us see things clearer and also accelerate action. So the need for solutions and answers has become more urgent now. And I'm very happy that events like this can be very useful in crafting those responses that policymakers need to give. In the Federal Republic of Germany, as you might know, work is regulated primarily by national labor law. But the 16 federal states of Germany, of which Hamburg as a city state forms actively part, have an influence on it because we are co-legislators in our second chamber of representation, the Bundesrat. And so we are actively involved in shaping the federal legislation where we bring in our expertise. Apart from those legislative actions, there are also various other possibilities to face the upcoming challenges and discuss eventual regulation. And we're very active in that. The Federal Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, which happens to be just around the corner from our representation here, deals with them by, for example, implementing a specific organizational unit called Policy Lab Digital Work in Society, which you might know and be aware of or have worked with, just as one example. One of its topics is the platform economy, 
and its differences to other economic sectors, its risks and its opportunities. This was also a focus of the German EU presidency, so the leadership that Germany exercised in the second half of 2020 at the helm of the 27 EU member states. Hamburg as a federal state and a commercial city makes comparable efforts. The Senate, that is the government of Hamburg is in permanent and mutual exchange with social partners, with chambers of commerce, with local business associations, with science institutions, in an institutionalized network, the so-called Fachkräfte-Netzwerk, in which work 4.0 is one of the important topics. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to admit that digital change is also a great challenge for public administration, also for the work within the administration. And the current situation demands and allows a big step into digital work for all of us. And we see it here in our daily work in the representation. But of course, digitalization and automatization has also been a topic for public administration and politics before. And I want to shed light a little bit on that because for us in Hamburg, it's particularly important right now to look at digitalization because Hamburg for the present year has represented by my colleague and the head of Hamburg's Senate State Chancellery, State Secretary Jan Perksen, is in charge of leading the way in a format that is a collaborative format between the federal level and the federal states in which we want to accelerate uh, digitalization. The IT Planning Council and Hamburg is in the lead here this year. So for us, it's also very important uh, to look at questions of the nature and kind uh, that you are discussing here today and we're eager to learn. Now, primarily the focus of this council is the digital transformation of government and public administration to provide improved services for citizens. So two of the focuses of Hamburg's chair in 2021 are digital collaboration and digital sovereignty. And they can also be linked to the idea of good work, both within and outside public administration. From these few examples that I'm taking the time to give you, and thank you for your precious time, you can see that politics in Hamburg and in Germany is aware of and very much concerned with the digital transformation of work, digitalization in general, and the needs of its regulation. We are exploring in many ways new territory, but we are already, I think, feeling more and more comfortable in the territories that we have explored in this field. And there are already some big wheels that are turning and uh, I'm much looking forward to hearing more about what you will be discussing in this webinar. So let us have a closer look at the tools in the policymakers box for regulating current and future work on the one hand, and providing digital education and training on the other hand. I'm looking forward to all your ideas and inputs into the workshop and thank you all again for putting this together and for having us part of the conversation. Thank you so much, um, Almut, um, for these encouraging opening words. Um, and thank you so much for hosting us today um, for our event. Um, unfortunately, I, I cannot be in the representation and I regret that very, very much. Um, I think we will be forced to do remote work for quite a while uh, because of the COVID uh, crisis. But I'm very, um, I'm very happy and very grateful that you made it possible for my team, um, Toby and Olivia, um, to be in the representation today and also have the whole setup, that, um, the whole studio um, at our disposal. And I've, I, I heard it's really a great uh, tech setup and I hope that we can do it um, on site um, later on this year again. So thank you so much for making all that effort. Um, of hosting us physically on the ground, um, so to say, in the embassy of Hamburg um, in Berlin. Let me also extend a huge uh, thank you to our partner, Microsoft. Um, this whole event series um, uh, 
tech and the worker would not have been possible um, without our strong partner, Microsoft. And not only this, we have cooperated in many different fields. Um, you were, Microsoft was a partner in our artificial intelligence conference. Um, we are working together on content management um, and media literacy, lots of issues of great relevance to the resilience of our societies and our economies. So thank you very, very much. As Almut said, this is not the first um, event in our um, tech and the worker, worker series, but it's the fourth one. So let me briefly remind us um, what we looked at in the past events. So we um, discussed together the lessons from past industrial revolutions. Um, we looked at or discussed how a new social compact contract um, fit for, digital, for the digital age um, could look like. And we also looked at um, how automation um, changes uh, the workplace, what that means for skills and at uh, education cycles. Um, our past discussions were mainly um, off the record, but because of the great rele relevance of this topic, um, we decided to uh, do this um, in a bigger public sphere today. Um, so feel free um, to share um, this event and the lessons learned um, with all your colleagues um, and everybody who was or who is not able um, to join. Why did we launch the series and why do we believe this is so important? Because exactly out of the reasons which Almut um, already mentioned, digitalization, the digital revolution is changing everything. How we work, how we communicate, how we travel, how we live. It is just changing our whole societies um, and in positive ways. Um, but also in some negative ways, or at least let's say it poses some risks which we need to address um, to uh, continue to have or increase the resilience um, of our societies. So um, on, on the business side, digitalization, and I'm telling you nothing new at all, led to huge productivity gains. Um, on the other hand, however, it also poses the threat of displacement of workers and it poses a huge challenge uh, to skills, um, to, to develop new skills, and i.e. also to our education systems. In today's event, we want to take a closer look at these issues, um, and we want to do this in a truly transatlantic uh, setting today. Um, and we want to learn more about state initiatives. So not just to look at the federal level, um, but also look at what the states, what states are doing and can do on the sub-federal level. And we also want to learn um, how the pandemic has uh, impacted um, education policies. Um, maybe um, it has advanced them, but maybe it has also moved the focus slightly away from them. Um, and we need to discuss this and see what we have to improve. Um, and I would now like to introduce um, our stellar moderator um, to you, uh, who is Shelley Stewart. She is the director of the Future of Work Initiative at our, I would say, mother institute, uh, the Aspen Institute, uh, United States, our mother board. Um, and she is also a postdoctoral fellow with the um, Fair Work Foundation at the Oxford Internet Institute. And um, Shelley, you are not just a moderator um, for the topic, you are an expert on your own right. Um, you bring in a really interesting perspective of your own, you're an economic sociologist. So I'm also really keen on hearing your opinion, although you're our moderator of today. So thank you so much for taking, um, taking this job. And, um, I also would like to um, point at my team, at Olivia and Toby, who are the masterminds on the Aspen Germany site um, for the series, and who are also um, here today to facilitate our discussion and to facilitate the Q&A session. Um, so um, you can always, after the, after the event, also contact, contact them for further input um, for an exchange. Um, it's our digital team at Aspen, and they are always open for an exchange. Without further ado, I thank all of our partners again, and certainly all of our panelists who are now going to be introduced by Shelley. And I hand it over into your trustworthy hands. Shelley, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you to our participants joining from both sides of the Atlantic and potentially all over the world for what promises to be, I think, a really important and interesting conversation about the future of work, which 
we increasingly are realizing is not some distant point in the future we need to predict, but it's here and we're, we're living through it every day. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to hearing the, the thoughts and remarks of our uh, panelists, which I'll briefly introduce uh, and then uh, open it up with, with some questions. Uh, so we're joined by Anya Peel, who is a member of the executive board at the German Trade Union Confederation, where she's responsible for labor market and social policies, migration and anti-racism, the Fair Mobility Project, and the DGB Legal Protections. Uh, she's also an alternating chairwoman of both the administrative board of the Federal Employment Agency in Germany uh, and the Federal Board of Directors of the German Pension Insurance Association. Uh, and she's also worked for the United Services Trade Union and has been a member of the Lower Saxony State Parliament. Uh, so a, a range of really important uh, perspectives that, that she'll be bringing to our conversation. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Anna Kopp, who is currently the head of IT for Microsoft in Germany, where she drives business processes and technology. She's been with Microsoft for more than 16 years and was responsible for global customer satisfaction in the online division prior to her current role. Uh, she's also the regional office lead in Munich, where she thinks about the modern world of work from a cultural perspective uh, and is an advocate for, for flexible work styles. Then we are also joined by Roy Bahat, who is the head of Bloomberg Beta, an early stage venture firm that has focused on the future of work and, and artificial intelligence. Uh, he's also faculty of the University of California, Berkeley Haas School of Business, uh, and sat on California's Future of Work Commission, which recently released a report this spring with some really excellent recommendations. Uh, and he has a background leading in business, government, and nonprofit roles. Uh, and then lastly, although she's not here yet, but will be joining a bit later in the conversation, we have Tennessee State Senator Ramesh Akberi, who was elected to the Tennessee State Senate after three terms in the State House of Representatives. Uh, she's the chair of the Senate Democratic Caucus and former chair of the Tennessee Black Caucus of State Legislators. Uh, and has spoken at two uh, Democratic National Conventions. Uh, she's a, a Memphis native who has introduced legislation dealing with education and job growth. Uh, so, so very relevant to, to this conversation. Uh, now I'll, I'll go ahead and, and turn it over to each of our speakers. And, and by means of introducing yourself, uh, I'd, I'd really like to hear what, what you see as the key challenges facing workers in the next few years. Uh, and, and if you could tell us a little bit about what you've been doing recently to, to understand those challenges uh, or potentially to address them uh, from, from your position, position and perspective. Uh, so let's start with uh, Anna. Hello, thank you so much, Shelley, for that introduction. And uh, um, you hit it on the spot there. Um, I have this pleasure to do both a technological modern workplace role uh, and think about the IT systems and processes, and at the same time, look at the, the culture. Um, and if we're looking, just looking back at the last year, we all know what happened. And our leader, Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, said about a year ago or last summer, we have experienced two years of digitalization in two months. And, and that's totally true. Everything went so fast. And uh, a lot of customers came to us to, uh, to get help. And interestingly, it was not about talking about the products or how, where do I click? Or what do I install or what project would I need to do? It was about the, the culture. How do you work? How do you live? Because we've been working like this since in Germany since 2013. So with that, we, we realized we, we need to talk about and showcase and not just how we work, but how we are, because it's ingrained in our total business. Um, so that's what we've been doing for the last year, talking much more about culture. Um, and one point coming from me being the RO lead, or regional office lead, means that I'm responsible for the Munich HQ, the office, out of a, a really a, a facilities and workplace um, uh, perspective. Um, 
And we're thinking a lot about, and I know we're going to discuss later, so is the workplace going to stay the same? Um, because I think it's going to move from a workplace to a meeting place, to a showcase place, um, to um, a place where we go in with a specific purpose, but we don't go to work to work. Um, but you have to, in the digital transformation time, still get the basics right uh, with that, so that you have the processes, you do have the tools that uh, employees need, not just in the office, but to work from anywhere, anytime. But the most important part is learning, skilling, and uh, the change management, because you can't just say, hey, work from home, everyone, have fun, and I'll check in on you. You have to take them by the hand. So that's overall so that I, oh, the whole picture of my perspective uh, today, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much. I think you know, a lot of the, the reports about the most in-demand skills for the future focus on the high-tech digital skills and also the, the social skills, the interpersonal skills. Uh, so your, your position and perspective really brings those together. Uh, Anya, why don't we hear from you about challenges that workers are facing today? Yes, let me uh, first say thank you for the opportunity to speak here. Um, and I will try to open up the policymakers toolbox yet. The last workshop will imagine new policy instruments uh, that can help reconcile technological progress and social cohesion. Are new forms of taxation and regulation necessary to do redesign the social safety net to capture and equitably distribute tax productivity gains across society? Are schemes like universal basic income helpful potential offsets? Uh, are other systems of labor market resilience helpful? Digitization is not only about technology, it is about changing our everyday life. So we have to perceive that economy affecting the world of work at large. Uh, the paramount potential of new technologies, especially artificial intelligence, refers to fundamental change in value creation rather than a replacement of human work. For example, IE connectivity and networking locked in effects will result in novel customers um, relations. Thus industrial relations and power structures are in the course of fundamental change with economic and social, social impacts regarding value change, the future of work, social inequality, or even policy making. Another decisive factor is how to shape the human machine interface. Of course, digital assistance systems could make the workflow more efficient and others offers opportunities for work-life balances, flexible and upskilled work. As an example, we can design work to accustom workers' age, increase employment opportunities for people with disabilities, um, and improve occupational health and safety. But the human-machine interface has to be shaped carefully because digital assistance systems like interactive robots, robots need to collect, analyze, and work with the person, personal data um, of the employees in order to support them. Using big data and um, um, proceeding employees can become measured and monitored even in a predictive way regarding future performance. Thus, we have to solve conflicting goals by finding solutions to protect workers' autonomy and privacy, as well as to take advantage of new technology improving working conditions. Um, artificial intelligence-based systems are not mysteries, but uh, tools to optimize various purposes showing different degrees of criticality. Such systems are made by humans. The key question is who decides on the goals uh, that that would pursue to make it improve working uh, conditions it is a key requirement to let workers and their representatives participate and negotiate the goals of the use of technology from the very beginning during the processes of operational usage employees must have 
a direct sale. Thus, we need to strengthen bargaining and co-determination rights. A breaking point for all that in the workplace is the question of personal data. It must be not used for individual uh, profiling to predict someone's future performance and dismiss employees who cannot meet the artificial generated performance expectations. As a matter of fact, many digital applications include trade-offs. We have to discuss and flesh out smart regulations. Digitization will not increase working condition by itself, but has to be shaped collectively to take the chances to bring process in progress. Trade unions are participating in the political process about industry 4.0, work 4.0, and um, all that for years. In addition, social partners in Germany are conceiving, elaborating, and accompanying several research projects and innovation spaces on specific issues and modeling the digital working environment to enhance the working conditions. Meanwhile, this had led to collective agreements in some industries about innovative work time solutions. On the other hand, conflict lines will not dissolve by technology regarding alignment, regulation, and distribution. For example, the rise of the gig economy causes new questions shaping flexible work in a better way, including social security. Policymakers should not just debate opportunities and threats on an abstract level. For example, in the field of artificial intelligence, there are several approaches and tools and international and national level policymakers should embrace and put into practice to create a framework or trust. However, digitization is made by human and it will remain human responsibility shaping the digital world, in particular, the world of work. In conclusion, we should not wait any longer, but start creating the future of work and set up an appropriate framework. Thank you. Thank you, Anya, for, for drawing attention to both some of the risks and the potential benefits of, of increasing automation, uh, digital, digital tools, and, and data in the workplace. Uh, so looking forward to continuing to explore some of the, the possible solutions to those uh, risks uh, as this, this conversation moves on. Uh, I'll now turn it over to Roy to hear a bit about what you see as, as some of the key challenges. Thank you, Shelley. Uh, I'm going to focus on talking about some of the questions to which we don't yet know the answers. Uh, I am a startup investor who runs the first venture capital fund, so far as we know, in the world that focused on the future of work. We've been doing it for almost a decade. Um, we were also the first venture capital fund uh, to focus on investing in artificial intelligence, which we've been investing in since 2014. And a couple of years into our work, we realized that unless we had a vision for how society as a whole would adapt throughout these changes, it was literally irresponsible to continue doing what we were doing. And so we set off on a quest to learn. And in that quest, we consulted with leaders in every segment of American society. Our focus was on the US. We met with truck drivers to ask them their opinions on the self-driving truck in Ohio. We met with legislators around different states in the United States um, and visited high schools where entrepreneurship is taught and went on every possible learning expedition we could go, read every book we could find. And what we realized is nobody yet has a solution to this problem. The wonderful work that's been done by the Aspen Institute and the California Commission on the Future of Work and so many others, uh, at the moment amounts to lists of possible ideas for things that could be helpful as opposed to a comprehensive vision. And I'll share a couple of views that I've collected along the way and a couple of the unanswered questions and we can continue um, to discuss them. Um, one view I have is that technology is like weather. You can shape it, but only very gradually over long periods of time with pretty fundamental actions, the same kinds of actions that governments can take to fight climate change. 
And much of the regulatory attention has been, in my mind, foolishly focused on managing the current introduction of technologies. For those, it's mostly too late to regulate. They're moving too quickly. And too little attention is focused on the fundamental question of what are the technologies that we'll build for 20 years from now? We seem to have a slight technical glitch from Roy out in California. Uh, definitely was excited to, to hear the rest of his thoughts and, and well, hopefully he's able to reconnect. Uh, we have been joined by Tennessee State Senator Ackberry. Uh, so if I can turn it over to you to hear some of your perspectives on this uh, as, as Roy hopefully gets reconnected. Thank you, certainly. Uh, so some, some of the things that we've seen uh, really has to do with, and I think Roy was touching on it a bit, uh, educating the workforce, right? Uh, we have um, a series of unskilled workers who will potentially not uh, have employment because uh, as AI continues to increase, some of the uh, activities uh, that they're able to do, they will be replaced. Um, I read a book several years ago called The Second Machine Age, and it focused on that, how technology continues to improve with each generation of that technology. I remember when we... Um, when we first got these the, the, the USB memory sticks and how expensive they were. And now people give them away free at conferences or they put the conference booklet on there instead of having to print them. Uh, I have a vehicle now that if I turn on a certain, if I press a certain button, it will make me stay in my lane and it will on cruise control, it will make sure that I uh, have a certain amount of car lengths away from the vehicle in front of me. Uh, so technology is changing and, and it's growing at a rapid pace and the question is, for me at least, a big concern is, will our workforce be ready for it? Um, you look at the companies that were leading 30 years ago, and a lot of them don't exist anymore, particularly in America. They don't exist anymore. And they've been replaced by companies like, you see, Amazon. If I want to order something, it, it gets here the next day. Sometimes it can be delivered the same day. It, it totally changes what it means to have a store with, those, with, with people in that store. So I think uh, preparing our workforce, making sure that they're even able to repair these uh, these these different um, uh, technologies, that's a big thing as well. There's a high demand for it. We have in the city that I live in, we have allegedly 16,000 open uh, jobs that people just are not trained to be able to, to walk into. Uh, so that's a big thing for us. Uh, something that we've done in Tennessee, we made, and, and this is probably not as relevant in other countries, but for us, it was uh, we made community college and any technology school free of charge uh, for all graduating high school students. And then we came back and we made it free for anyone over the age of 24. It's in an effort to try and educate people and give them the skill sets that they need uh, to move forward in this next uh, in this next generation of jobs. Uh, so that's what I see as one of the biggest threats. Uh, making sure that you have a workforce that's ready to meet the challenges and also that's able to transition because the careers that they have right now will not exist. And in order to keep our, stabilize our economy and make sure that our unemployment rate stays low, we have to make sure that employees are ready to meet that challenge. And a lot of that I think falls on employers. Um, places like Google and Apple offer free training uh, for employees. Um, and those are things we have to kind of lean into. And, and part of why they do it is because there's a, um, there's a, a demand for, for those types of companies, I mean, for those types of workers. And I'm sure Microsoft does the same thing, but um, I believe that's one of our biggest challenges that we have here. And, and it's like, are, are we doing enough to meet that need? Yes, uh, thank you so much. I think we've had a full, full range of challenges laid out and, and in some ways it's incredibly daunting. Um, and, and hopefully through this conversation, we'll also feel inspired by, by some of the work that, that our panelists are doing out in the world to, to try to address some of these challenges and, and pave the way towards, towards a, a brighter future. Uh, one of the things that we see, one of the sets of challenges, uh, Anya definitely spoke to this a bit, uh, is a, a breakdown of the, the relationship between workers and employers in a lot of cases, uh, with workers increasingly carrying economic risks. 
so we see this reflected in an increasing reliance on outsourced and contracted work, uh, the rise of the, the gig economy. Uh, these, these workers often face pretty high levels of insecurity uh, and at the same time struggle with, with fewer benefits and, and fewer protections. Uh, I want to start again with, with Anna. Uh, Microsoft has been recognized uh, for, for offering relatively generous benefits to its employees and its contractors. It's, it's unique in that, that way. Uh, so, so how can other employers be incentivized to, to follow suit? Kind of what's, what's the business case for offering uh, stronger, more comprehensive benefits? Um, thank you. So, um... There's, there's a few things I usually answer. This comes up so often. Um, and yet, let's just pretend there's not a pandemic. You should always value your workers because there's nothing as expensive as having a constant you know, now, uh, uh, exchange of the people that are working for you. You need, to, you need to find them. You need to train them. And then they leave you again. And before they come on board, it usually takes up to six months if you have a very skilled worker. And the thing is, if you're uh, an employer that really values your employees, it, the word gets around, which means that the best people are, are going to want to work for you, um, which means that you're increasing the quality as well as the, 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 the lifetime of an employer with you. So in general, this is just a no brainer that that's something you want to do, because today we don't have enough talent. We have the war for talent out in the market. And we really need to get the people that are best to our company. And with the best, and this is important to say, it's not necessarily the highest educated or, or someone with a, a doctor title. It's the person that fits my culture, my motive, you know, how they, my, the, the teamwork that fits in the team and the values that we are bringing, because that person is going to feel so much more happy working for me. So, so that's the one key thing. Um, and there's a couple of universal truths here. I'm going to share two with you um, with my sock puppets. Um, number one is what I just said is um, every company I speak to, and I've spoken to hundreds of customers, small companies with three employees, uh, uh, mayors uh, in, in the deepest black forest, and uh, spoken to Deutsche Bank or the really big uh, DAX uh, Fortune 500 companies. They all have the same issue. And everyone nods when I say this. They all have to do more with less every year, more marketing uh, uh, with less budgets, more IT with less resources. So that's why I'm saying you need the best because when you have to drive efficiency at some point, that's the last lever you have. It's the best people. And that's the number one you know, uh, universal truth. And the second truth is if I don't do it, someone else will. Someone else will come in there and swoop the best guys up. It's, it's the total competitive edge today to provide that and care for your workers. And I just want to quickly build on something Ramesh said, because that's so true with the learning and skilling and, and so on. Something we at Microsoft are doing, we're hearing from new employees or people that want to come work for us. What's the, what can I learn? What certifications can I do? What can I kind of take on board? So we're seeing that for the, on the benefit side, learning and skilling and courses and certifications are increasing in importance because I, I value up my own profile. So we spend a lot of, of uh, budgets and we're planning for lots of trainings there. So um, that's also a perspective that learning and skilling, you're going to hear a lot in the next five years about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I really appreciate how you tie the, the conversation about training in with the conversation about the safety net in such a, a rapidly changing world that that skilling and that training becomes part of what workers need to, to survive and to find opportunity. Uh, thank you. Uh, so Roy has been able to, to rejoin us after a few technical difficulties. Um, and, and Roy, you served on the, the California Future of Work Commission, uh, which recently released a report that, that really highlighted the need for a renewed safety net for workers. Uh, so could you tell us a little bit about what we can learn from the commission's work about how to do this? Sure. And I apologize for dropping off. Leave it to the tech guy to have an internet issue. Um, the, it ties to um, what, where I was headed to about the unsolved questions, which is 
I found it useful as I've spoken to policymakers and business people to divide the future of work into two questions. One is what I call a, a little bit judgmentally, the future of work for us. And by that, I mean people like the people on this call, people who have information industry jobs, who are, um, you know, benefit from the digital transformation of the workplace. But in the US at least, at peak, just as one course measure, only about half of people were working from home. And to me, the more pressing societal question, not about the future of work, but as several people have said about work today, is the future of work for all, not for us. And that is a question that the California Commission began to look at and I'll just pose a couple of the dilemmas about that because we in the California Commission, like the Aspen Institute, came out with a portfolio of different strategies to use to address this. I think the reason we have a portfolio, it might be because all these actions are necessary and it might be because we don't really yet know what to do. And I'll give one simple version of the unsolved problem, which is name jobs for which there will be millions more people needed in the job that provide for a family at a reasonable standard of living, that are a good job, that provide stability and dignity, which are the two things that we've found in research workers crave more than anything else, more than making more money, more than meaning, which turns out is a thing that only people, at least in the US, who make more than $150,000 a year say that they care about. And the jobs are either few and powerful for for satisfying a family's needs. So the high competition jobs that somebody who is um, in a technology company might have count there, but those are not an answer for society as a whole. Or the jobs are many, but insufficient. You know, a good example of that kind of work is a home health care aid, again, at least in the United States. And some necessary elements of the solution, of course, include organized labor, where Germany is far ahead of the United States on um, this kind of infrastructure for working people. A stronger floor, I don't think of it as a safety net because a net is designed to catch people when they fall. We actually need people who have never even had the opportunity to participate to have the resources, whether through a guaranteed income, universal health care, which again is something in the US that we struggle with, um, to even be able to participate freely in the economy because we have a slowing um, uh, economic dynamism, lower rates of entrepreneurship historically that now than we've had historically, not acceleration as uh, as many people in tech believe. And so that those are the set of questions we need. But the ultimate question is, what are things that millions of people can do that can provide? And I'll just throw one last wrench into things, which is based on looking at all the various training programs that I've seen, they're so seductive because you just think, well, we'll keep the system as it is and we'll just run some classes and then everybody will be okay. It seems that they don't work. Whether people are demanding them or not, um, it seems that they are not at least as backed by government um, or by civil society or by the corporates, you know, which need to provide this training in order to, um, uh, to provide skills for some. It does not seem like a societal answer. And I think we continue to pursue it because we wish it were. Uh, uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, you know, as, as Roy pointed to, things, things are different in, in Europe on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, and, and many see Europe as having a, a stronger safety net than the US. Uh, so Anya, I'd like to ask you, what aspects of Germany's approach to safety net and workplace benefits do you think are most promising? hand uh, we see an urgent need to foster applied technologies in Europe. We have a great basic research but we are lagging because the main challenge is putting technology into workplace practice but we have to bear in mind that's not only a question of technology itself but also a challenge of creating new business and work organization models. Of course we have to catch up in terms of data and infrastructure structure and capacity, but we should aware of a particular European strength in industries, research and social values. We have a long standing market uh, economy model that aims to couple economic 
and social uh, prosperity. This should also apply to the digital single market. Uh, trade unions play a key role to ensure that this social contract will be continued and renewed so that workers benefit from economic growth even more in the future. However, today's problems refer more to the fact that there's uh, hardly any progress in productivity due to digitization, but the profits are distributed very unequally in favor of big technology companies. Thank you. Uh, we'll definitely return to some of the ideas around the, the power balance between workers and companies uh, a, bit, a bit later in the conversation. Uh, as a, a last question on the safety net before we do move on, uh, one approach to rebuilding the safety net is to dissociate benefits from work entirely. Uh, and one way of doing this is through a universal basic income or direct cash assistance uh, program. Uh, and we've seen growing interest, experimentation, and research into these types of programs in the past year. Uh, the city of Los Angeles just recently announced um, some experimentation into, into these programs. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, the panelists, and, and I'd invite any of you to, to jump in here, uh, what, what have we learned about this? And, and is UBI a promising approach? Well, I think it's a promising approach to really uh, hit and address the problems of poverty uh, in our country. Um, unfortunately, I live in a state like Tennessee where we do not even have a minimum wage. Our minimum wage aligns with the federal minimum wage. Uh, but when you when you look at those who who are on um, these types of entitlement benefits, the fastest way to move them out of poverty is to increase the cash benefit that they receive. Uh, in Tennessee, they receive like maybe two hundred, less than three hundred dollars per month, which is nothing, um, especially when people are trying to move from um, you know barely surviving to thriving. Uh, so I definitely think that that it makes a difference. One, because when people have some sort of basic stability, uh, then they can seek uh, more uh, higher education and more training so that they can be prepared for other types of jobs. The, the problem that a lot of folks have when we're talking about completing some sort of post-secondary education or training usually has to do with income, being able to one, uh, pay their bills, it's a usually, or a childcare issue or a transportation issue. And I certainly think that uh, areas, um, I believe it wasn't Compton, it was some area in California, it was a young, young mayor. Who, Stockton. Who, yeah, there you go, uh, it, Stockton. And he proposed, and I thought it was pretty successful. Unfortunately, he lost his reelection. So it's just really, it, it, politics is a tricky thing, but uh, I definitely think it's something worth exploring. And when you look at uh, uh, European countries where they do have more of a safety net uh, compared to, to countries in America, I mean, if you have a we don't even have universal health care. So if you have a car accident, it could potentially devastate your entire family. So you're not thinking about preparing for anything in the future. You're just trying to make sure that you don't get evicted uh, or that your kids can eat or that you can pay for the medicine that they need. Uh, so I think it, it would it would go a long way um, in, in areas, particularly in the South where you see such tremendous poverty, but no real interest in investing in any of these types of ideas to really move the needle forward. I could not agree more. I mean, I think that um, Stockton, California, which experimented with a guaranteed income distributed at random to people in some of the poorest geographic areas, census tracts, um, did extensive study on their program. And not only did they find that it was, of course, helpful in helping people's economic light, uh, life and their um, emotional and mental well-being, a guaranteed income also help people participate in work. People worked at a higher rate, which will be no surprise to people who spend time listening to the life stories of those who are struggling, because you hear every day about somebody who would love to apply for a job if only they could take enough time off to go apply for that other job or afford the bill required for the transport to go there and back. And I believe that if we want a more vibrant economy, we need everybody to be able to participate and one framing for governments to consider. And I do believe that Germany and the EU generally are closer to this framing than the United States is 
um, when we have something in our society that begins to become so fundamental that we can't imagine living without it, at least in the US and to some degree in other places, we start using the language of a right. And rights are enabled by the stability of a society to provide them. And so it's possible that the way we should think about economic security is that it's a right and a guaranteed income could be a cornerstone to that. Thank you. Uh, I would take this moment to remind our audience that you are welcome to submit questions at any point through the chat feature. Um, and we'll turn to some of those audience questions toward, towards the end of our conversation. Uh, so some of these last, last comments that we've heard speak to inequality uh, and the, the extent to which economic inequality has been increasing, uh, especially in the US uh, over the past half century or so. Uh, and we've seen this really reflected in the, the K-shaped recovery of the COVID-19 pandemic, where those at the top have seen investments appreciate, uh, they've tended to have remote jobs that were relatively unthreatened. Uh, and then we have those at the bottom who have faced unprecedented unemployment uh, and really struggled to access some, some basic necessities. Uh, Anya spoke about some of the, the power dynamics between these, these groups as well. Uh, and we see this, this same pattern, the same inequality really playing out among firms. Uh, well, small businesses and, and many startups have really suffered great losses over the past year. Uh, big tech companies have, have come out on top with, with unprecedented profits. Uh, so, so let's think a bit about what policies might effectively address this inequality uh, at, at the top end of this distribution. Uh, so, so we've seen proposals out there for a digital tax. Uh, we've heard more conversations about antitrust measures and the extent to which they apply to, to today's tech companies. Uh, so, so again, opening it up to, to any of our panelists, um, what, what do you think of some of these ideas and, and what others should we be talking about? Anna, why don't you go ahead? I saw you go off mute. And I also raised the hand using that functionality. Um, so speaking from the German perspective, of course, uh, uh, keeping that in mind, one of the things we've been working towards uh, to influence, and where I was having conversations last year with uh, um, the Minister of Digitalization from uh, Baden-Württemberg, that led to a, a law proposal that was even entered to the ministry. Um, we have very strict labor conservational law uh, which limits the work, the way we can work flexibly. So going back to the modern workplace and, and, and so on. And uh, even if I have my PC, my mobile phone and the network and everything, I can work from home. It's still a gray zone for the law. So some companies, because they have a works council, one of the, the key things to always have on board to make sure that you are uh, protecting your employees, is that they were hesitant to have people working flexibly and it's not just about doing the work it's about com commuting being on a train with people possibly with an infection where we see that there's spikes so overall protecting your employees um, and for everyone who is not familiar i get a very short summary of what the law is so that you have to have a uh, when you end your day there has to be um, um, 11 hours of break before you're allowed to start again and the reason this is, is when you used to go to a trade fair a whole week, they're standing from morning to evening, then you pack everything up. And at nine o'clock at night, you have a six hour drive going home. So you're protected. You're not allowed because it's still working time and you're not allowed to work the next morning or drive home because you could cause an accident. Today, what's actually happening, I can leave it to pick up my kids, um, you know, have dinner, homework, all those things and, and work flexibly. And this is away from pandemic times, just normal office work. And then in the evening, I'll go back to my PowerPoint and, and, and work on my presentation for tomorrow. Theoretically, I, that's not allowed because then I'm not allowed to be in the office eight o'clock the next morning because they need to protect me, but I might move from the sofa all the way to the fridge twice or more times. Um, and that's not the same as a six hour drive home from a, a trade fair conference. Um, and we're just realizing now that this, uh, the, the flexible workplace, we still don't have the protective laws in place. 
uh, which would help companies right now also to allow more flexibility and moving into the future, even have more hybrid workplace. And we as a company at Microsoft, because we're global, we've made sure that the rules that we are running right now are valid for uh, every employee's fairness employee in US, but in all of the rest of the world to make sure that everyone can, can have the chance to work like this and be efficient in the way we're working. But each country still has to work towards the, uh, the legal situation. Yeah, yeah your, your comments speak to the fact that some of our existing laws, whether they're labor protections or regulations or, or any number of laws, don't really apply to the world that we live in today. Uh, and pose lots of, of really interesting but difficult questions about, about what that means. Uh, yeah. other, other panelists, would you like to, to weigh in on this question about the, the inequality we face and, and what can be done about it? Well, so I, I look at it like um, in Tennessee, we pay to build our roads by tax on gas, right? But as vehicles become more efficient and, and some are have no reliance on gasoline, it makes it more difficult for us to pay for our roads. And so therefore we have to change our, our taxing structure uh, to accommodate that. Uh, so I, I feel the same way. I think with, when it comes to technology, as technology continues to grow, I do believe that it should be able to help pay or the industry should help pay for uh, kind of providing more equity or providing more education or providing these frameworks where people can um, can thrive in, in that industry. I totally think that it's it's very, it's interesting. The pandemic has really shown a lot of industry where they just insisted that folks be in an office for a certain period of time, although they don't have to do that anymore. Uh, and, and, but it also highlighted gross inequities um, in certain communities when our children had to go to online school exclusively and they didn't even have um, high-speed internet in their neighborhoods. In our rural communities, they don't have access to, to, to broadband. In our urban communities, there are issues with technology and not having access. So the school systems had to buy laptops for every student and buy hotspots so that they could have a strong internet signal. Uh, it, it showed, but in an ideal world, they should already have this type of technology because it's so needed. Uh, can you imagine being in a community where the only type of internet you have is dial up? I mean, and it's 2021. I, there's nothing that you can do as far as functioning on a website uh, with dial up at all. Um, so I think that certainly there are opportunities through different taxes and regulations to, uh, to, to pay for these types of advancements. Now, fortunately, um, I think in America, at least, they hopefully they will finally settle on an infrastructure development plan. Uh, the federal government will, because this is something we've been talking about for, I mean, years, and the states have had to pick up the slack. So our governor is investing $200 million in broadband this year, or our state will be, uh, but that's not even going to, like, 1% of the population, maybe less. I mean, it's just, there's such a significant need, uh, and I think uh, that th there's ample opportunity, in my mind at least, for, for the industry that benefits from it to also help move things forward. And I fully agree with yes, that. I mean, uh, thank you. I'm working from a remote rural area now with a, a mobile hotspot because there is no broadband. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the challenges are real. Um, I think we've, you know, through this conversation, we've turned to, oh, Roy, were you going to- I was only going to add that I don't think we need particularly complex public policy to resolve this issue. I mean, I think better, more consistent, loophole-free enforcement of tax law would probably do the trick. And, you know, I think there's a cultural challenge here too, which is as the pandemic has freed many people to work from wherever they want, many people are moving at the highest end of the wealth spectrum are moving to the least cost tax jurisdiction. And while that's an understandable thing, I think there's also something somewhat shameful in it, in the sense that, you know, these places created the conditions that enabled that wealth to be um, built in the first place. You know, show me the career of any great technologist and I'll show you a way that some government spending was without which 
you know, they would not have succeeded, you know, whether it's the first web browser or the internet as a whole or name your thing. I mean, those are, that's public infrastructure. And so I think that's really what we need. And at the same time, I think that the fever pitch around focusing on the unfairness at the top of the distribution can oftentimes distract us from a real economic question, which is this is a thing that's going to affect shifting the social contract will require contributions and not just benefits from all members of society. It's not just the best off who will be needed because there simply aren't enough resources even there. Um, and so those are the tough questions that I think we all need to face together. Yeah, uh, thank you for the, the reminder that as much as we do need new innovation, new policies, there's also existing frameworks and existing rules that, that need to be thought through, applied, followed, enforced. Um, so, so always a good reminder. Uh, we've talked quite a bit thus far about the, the acute challenges that, that we face, and I'd like to shift a bit uh, to thinking about how the future might be different. Um, and, and what we can do to usher in that change. Uh, so some of the problems that we've covered today, uh, from the, the shift of risk onto workers to, to widening inequality, uh, reflect an, an imbalance of power between workers and employers. Uh, and, and unionization, collective bargaining, uh, is one way to address this imbalance. And yet union membership in the US has, has long been declining and is at uh, pretty, pretty low rates. Uh, so Anya, I'd like to, to ask you, Germany has relatively well-organized trade unions and, and relatively effective collective bargaining agreements. Uh, what do you think, what role do you think unions can play in introducing new technologies into the workplace? Um, <clears throat> thank you. I, th I think um, we have, um, for the new technologies an urgent need for smarter regulation also in, in Europe and also in Germany in order to a new balance of power. Um, the regulation of the tech giants by global of European tech policy um, as currently discussed at uh, OECD level and um, uh, yet implemented in, in France, regulation of tech uh, giants by power restrictions and transparency obligations is intended by EU Commission by Digital Service Act and regulation of crowd and gig work as discussed in uh, European level to improve working conditions and prevent or stop distortion and uh, competition. Regulation of artificial intelligence systems and providers as proposed by EU comms white paper in order to gain acceptance for implementing artificial intelligence systems at workplace by ensuring transparency, not discrimination and enabling workplace impact assessment. So we have much to do um, in, in uh, um, enforce regulation uh, to, to have a balance also in Europe. Thank you. Uh, uh, Roy, I'd like to, to turn to you. Uh, you've recently joined the, the Chamber of Progress, uh, a trade group that, that represents tech companies uh, advocating for a range of, of democ primarily democratic policies. Uh, and from, from that perspective, what role do you see uh, unionizing and, and organizing of workers play in addressing some of our challenges? Well, that role is a little bit of an awkward one because I actually disagree with the Chamber of Progress on this point. Um, so the Chamber of Progress, well, you know what, I don't want to speak for them, I'll speak for myself, um, which okay. as an advisor Please. to an organization, you know, we sometimes agree and sometimes disagree. I don't see how we can get through the questions that we face without a much more organized labor movement. And that includes both unions and alternate forms of labor organization that may not require unions. Now, there are many problems to work out. Some of them are on the government side where the legal frameworks in the US to unionize are so complicated that really the main unions we have are all enormous. And there isn't that healthy kind of um, diverse ecosystem of different kinds of efforts that are um, as protected under the law. So it's simply too hard in some ways to run a union. And some of them are cultural um, in that business leaders see labor unions often as an unabashed negative uh, or at best as an inevitable force with which they have to make peace. 
Um, and I think that's a mistake. I think what we want is to develop a generation of business leaders who have the skill and savvy to collaborate with labor to do something that has yet to be done. And this is the part that now comes to labor as well, which is we need, if this is all going to work, examples of companies that are more successful than their competitors because of how their labor forces are organized. And that is a mentality that is not one that comes naturally to labor organizers who I've met. You know, only a very few leaders among them talk about ways of growing our shared prosperity as opposed to dividing up the spoils between management and labor. And if we see it as a matter of class conflict, I think we're unlikely to be able to collaborate to discover new ways of doing things. And I think that's what this moment requires if we're going to thrive. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that perspective. Uh, Anna, would you like to weigh in here as a business leader in a country with a, a more organized workforce? Um, yeah, happy to because it's uh, something that I work with on almost a daily basis. Uh, and I'm thankful for it because um, we always have um, clarity. It's always very clear what we need to do and it's clear what we can do and are allowed to do, which is very important. Um, and as I'm an employee as well, I know I have that full support if something should ever happen to me with the, the Works Council. Um, and um, because very often the question comes up, so Works Council, is, are they external or internal? How that works is uh, large companies um, have their employees. Um, uh, em it's elections internally in the company where you can put yourself up as a representative for the employees. And every four years there's elections, and then you're chosen or not. And you have to have an agenda if you are more liberal or more around data, et cetera. Um, out of the IT perspective, um, what I'm mostly um, uh, confronted with is when we integrate new processes and tools, we need to have approval. So you can't just go and roll out something and tell thousands of employees, now you're gonna work with this and we're gonna look at your data and see what you're doing all day. Because that would be uh, either performance tracking, which is not allowed, or behavioral tracking also not allowed. Um, so on one hand, sometimes out of a job perspective, I have months of negotiations, uh, but at the same time as an employee, I'm very happy that we do protect our employees like this. Uh, specifically around things like behavioral tracking. For example, you could never um, implement video cameras to track our people sitting at their desk or not. Um, and now that wouldn't really make sense anyway with people working from absolutely everywhere. Uh, whereas in other countries, this is allowed and you could have secret cameras catching you doing things. So um, with that said, it's uh, it's got a couple of sides to it that causes uh, a lot of work, but we're thankful for it in the end. And, and absolutely promote it because it's, uh, it is one of the strongest things in Germany. Here's the cool thing for my colleagues, actually. Um, most of the time, the works councils in other European countries, um, if Anna in Germany has gotten the approval, then it's okay for us too. So I'm saving others work. Excellent, uh, thank you. Um, and, and once again, reminding our, our audience to keep submitting uh, questions. We've gotten a, a couple of great ones so far and I will, will pose them to the panelists in, in just a moment. Um, before doing that, I wanna go to, to one other sort of set of solutions that has come up already, which is uh, the need for, for better and more accessible and more equitable uh, training for workers as we think about uh, evolving evolving job markets and evolving needs. Um, so, so Senator Akberi, uh, we've seen some, some legislation in Tennessee uh, to connect high schoolers to apprenticeships um, as, as one policy idea. So I was hoping you could tell us either a little bit about, about that proposal or, or any other uh, policy proposals that you see as, as promising in the world of, of training and skilling. Okay, sorry, I accidentally clicked off of Zoom. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, you'd think after a year with Zoom, we wouldn't have those issues. But anyway, uh, certainly I think any type of program, like an apprenticeship program that removes certain barriers to education is important uh, because you are allowing the student or the person to directly uh, participate in training that's going to allow them to move into a career. Uh, so I, I'm actually happy that the concept of apprenticeship programs are uh, coming back more and more 
uh, I think at one point there was this belief that you had to go to a four-year institution in order to be successful. And fortunately, we're realizing that's not the case. Um, and also apprenticeship is important because a lot of these um, more vocational or even more tech themed uh, career professions are not, they're not being trained in, in, in high school. The high schools have completely removed those programs. And so having an apprenticeship program is helpful. I also think allowing dual enrollment with um, our institutions of higher learning, our tech schools, our community colleges also helps get that person prepared uh, for, for that type of, of workforce. Um, we're working on legislation uh, and now it's, it's a heavy lift uh, that will help transition uh, or at least promote the idea of transitioning people from these traditional careers and jobs uh, that, that, that they, they know about to the ones that are going to be necessary in the future. And again, I think with Tennessee's emphasis on some sort of post-secondary education. Um, I think we, our previous governor, uh, basically he had something called the drive to 55. And that's because by 2020, I think 2020, 2022 actually, uh, 50%, 55% of our workforce will need some sort of post-secondary education. Uh, so, so I think that, that those are helpful. I think we need to do more though. Uh, we're just scratching the surface right now. Yes, uh, thank you. Roy. Yeah, if I can add, uh, I agree with all of that. And I think apprenticeship is a special form of training in the sense that it, it is both deeply adapted to that role, but also provides social capital in addition to skills. It provides relationships in the workplace. Somebody you can email or call who knows your name and knows your story. And so many of us in our own careers have credited those moments where somebody knew us as a person, whether it was somebody senior or somebody junior. And so just providing that more generally, I think is a wonderful thing for promoting shared understanding. The other thing I'd say is that the whole notion of training and jobs is a relatively kind of industrial era mentality in the sense that it goes along with schooling as preparation for participation as a person who is employed by someone else. And the norm for human societies for, you know, prior to the last few decades was self-employment. And so I wish that we had more opportunities for people to learn how to earn their own income in the absence of the permission of the boss, because that is the only job from which you can't get fired is working for yourself. And so California has a high school uh, for entrepreneurship where by the time the students have finished a public high school, they are, um, they are the creators of their own businesses that have begun to generate revenue. And while today it's hard to see how that is a sufficient solution on its own, it seems to me a necessary and missing part of the puzzle that we treat as a second class citizen and that's a mistake. Yeah, I've, I've long thought that the uh, education system does not always teach some of the, the kind of skills that you need in order to apply the skills that you might learn, uh, whether that's in the context of entrepreneurship and self-employment or in the context of understanding labor laws and, and workers' rights and, and what rights Absolutely. workers have on the job. Absolutely. So thank you for, for drawing attention to that. Um, I'm now going to start drawing on some of the, the audience questions uh, and we'll raise them for, for any panelists to, to jump in. So go ahead and, you know, if you'd like to weigh in on one of these questions, either turn yourself off mute or, or raise your hand and, and I'll invite you to, to comment. Uh, so first off, a, a question coming from someone from the, the Senate Democratic Caucus. Uh, do you believe that, uh, what, or excuse me, what role do you see uh, artificial intelligence and, and automation playing in upcoming election cycles? Uh, do you believe these topics will rise to a, a primary policy position for, for candidates seeking office? Uh, and I see Anna's hand. Yes, thank you. Because I, I understand this question come from the US, but we have exactly the same question in Germany and we have upcoming uh, elections this autumn too. So um, on AI and automa auto automation, we very often think the robots are going to come and take our jobs and, and that's not the case. Um, in the end, we, it's machine learning and it's data and we're, we're not where we need to be with data to be so clean that it will be um, better at doing the job than um, 
um, than uh, artificial uh, intelligence can do. And the, you can see that sometimes, you know, is this a, is this a picture of a cat? Um, and then it is a frog because it just kind of recognized some eyes. Um, we're not there yet, but we need to work on it. And I think, first of all, to be able to do AI and automation one day, we need to start in schools. We need to have data uh, understanding and data science as a class. Uh, in, in basic school already, because kids, they post anything, you know, here, Facebook and whatnot. And the story is when it's out, it's out. So we need to start early um, to drive a big understanding on how data should be managed so that we have the accuracy. Um, that's one point. So schools and education, which we talked about today, so it kind of fits in the major picture. And the second thing is who decides what AI is allowed to do? And I'll give a very short story from a customer here who um, they, they bottle mineral water from a well and then they ship it out on uh, big lorries. And they implemented um, an AI called Mary. Everyone had a button in the air and Mary told them exactly how much to put on which lorry and, and, and truck um, and uh, drive efficiencies, which was working well until Mary started to make suggestion to increase efficiency, we should start, we should basically sack people and even mention the names. You know, this person is slower than the other. So if you just, you know, riff him, uh, you will drive efficiency. And then they realized they had to stop it because it was just something automatically uh, the AI did um, and that they hadn't thought of. So who owns that? Is it the, polit uh, the politicians that need to create laws? Or do we, is it the companies that provide the AI or is it the companies that buy AI and implement it as a, as a, a service and, uh, and a tool internally? I think it needs to start with politics and defining what the governance should be. Um, the tech companies like us, and, and we had a few others, IBM and Apple uh, mentioned earlier, we need to follow uh, and follow the local laws, which is gonna be complex. And it should not be the customer that starts thinking about this, but, they have to keep an eye on it because every company is individual. Yes, thank you. Uh, a, a quick note from uh, Senator Akberry. She had to, to leave to meet with the, the governor of Tennessee, um, but, but thanks panelists and audience again for, for this conversation. Um, going to raise uh, another question uh, from our audience, this time from Leander Holweg, uh, who notes that access to education is often dependent on access to financial resources, uh, with, with challenges in both Europe and the US with uh, financing education. Uh, so, so two proposals uh, they've asked uh, panelists to comment on. Uh, first, creating a European bank for knowledge and education finance. Uh, and on the other side of the Atlantic, uh, reforming the US system of, of student loans and, and financing education. Uh, so again, panelists, please uh, raise your hand or turn yourself off mute if you'd like to, to weigh in on either of those ideas. No takers? Well, I mean, I just say that I think there are already, I, I can't speak to the, the EU bank, um, mm -hmm. uh, so I don't feel qualified there. But in the US, there are already experiments happening. I, I don't know about what government policy is necessary, but I think there are just so many people who recognize that paying an exorbitant cost and taking out debt for a credential as opposed to the hard learning, that there might be a better way. And so you see plenty of um, programs that are supplements to post-secondary education that often cost single digit thousands of dollars, which is still real money, but it's certainly not the tens of thousands of dollars per year that a top university can cost. And we also see financing experiments, things like um, income sharing agreements where a person pledges not to pay a fixed amount of debt, but to pay on a sliding scale based on how much they earn. And so I think that experimentation seems necessary. And I don't know that we yet have some answer of this experiment is working. We should do it throughout the whole society. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for that perspective. Uh, another question from Branka Andilkovic. Hello, Branka. Uh, and this question is for Roy again. Uh, what should be the features of a new social contract in the US? And, and who is to ensure it? I mean, it's sort of um, 
one of these questions where it's hard to imagine who shouldn't be involved. Ideally, we would see steps taken by the national government to frame the conversation. And I do think that the Biden administration, by providing generous assistance through the rescue plan and jobs plans, um, is uh, beginning to do that. And you know, the elements are the ones that we've been discussing, I think, thus far, a much higher floor so that people can participate in the economy, a call it a pro-future approach about public investment in uh, in the long-term future of scientific discovery, which is something where the US has begun to pull back and other nations continue to push ahead, and a much more organized labor sector to ensure that the benefits of prosperity can be shared by all without damaging the vitality and innovativeness of the economy as a whole. Those to me are some of, but not all of the primary components. But you know, if we knew, we'd be off legislating that instead of here trying to figure it out. Yes, yeah, and, and thanks for your first point about you know, the, the multiple parties that need to, to play a role. You know, a, a social contract by, by definition is a contract between different groups, different parties, and we really need to, to get everyone at, at the table. Uh, this question is from uh, Michael Betancourt, uh, and it's more of a, a political question. Uh, what role do panelists see uh, for addressing some of the social barriers to solutions like a, a universal basic income? Uh, there's some, some significant political barriers uh, that sort of get issues politicized, polarized across parties. Um, how can we sort of address that and, and think, think beyond some of the partisan lines towards uh, some solutions for all? Would be interested either, Roy, in your perspective or uh, perspectives from, from our German panelists as well. I can certainly offer, you know, just the US perspective quickly, which is it's already in the conversation, which it wasn't five or 10 years ago. Um, and thanks to, you know, presidential candidates like Andrew Yang and experiments by Mayor Tubbs in Stockton, who now um, is able because of, you know, he has uh, the time to do it to be an advisor across all of California. Um, on these efforts. So I think his impact is only going to spread. I think it's already in the conversation. I don't think we yet know precisely what the political dynamic is. It's not yet a lock to pick. We can't see the shape of the lock. I suspect that the very idea of the social contract is part of the problem. In the US, we see exchange as a main medium for um, intermediating uh, human relationships. And the problem with exchange is that it leaves out the idea that a person possesses some inherent worth or dignity that cannot be exchanged and just has to be honored. And so I think that thinking about what people fundamentally deserve in the basic standard and rights is probably a frame that is more likely to be lasting in the United States. Um, how do we get there? What are the steps? I will leave that to political experts. I don't really know. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to return to the, the part of the conversation on uh, some training and, and job readiness. Uh, and ask Anya to tell us a bit about Germany's vocational training model uh, and, and what the US might be able to learn from that way of training workers. Thank you. I, I think we all see an urgent uh, need to empower workers and employees and also the companies. Um, we said it before, especially um, coping with new challenges. Millions of current job profiles will change in the future. Um, and hence the requirements for the performance of jobs in the future. That is one of the most significant uh, challenge we are facing today. And a recent study of PVC on hopes and fears 2021 uh, revealed that one of three workers in Germany rated their own digital skills um, as insufficient for their own work. Um, as we know from many studies, many companies have neither a systematic strategy for human resources development, nor qualification planning. Um, thus, we see a need to empower the workers for lifetime learning, to be in a position um, 
to change a job and to collaborate and harness smart machines as a supporting systems. Uh, that requires a social commitment according to realize time, money, and social security um, for individual further training. The trade unions have already realized collective agreements facilitate part-time work due to qualification periods. Um, to foster lifelong learning for everyone we need, in addition, public programs avoiding unemployment and social tensions. Uh, due to these facts, we see an urgent need to strengthen the rights of workers, employees for public funded further training and qualification, and to strengthen the power of bargaining and go co-determination uh, rights, especially for training on the job, implementation and usage of um, AEC systems and personal data protection. So we have a need for enormous public investments in vocational and educational training. The universal basic income would be rather an unconditional surrender according uh, to the challenges and more than a, a side effect would uh, put pressure on wages and social standards here. The fact that companies could pay dumping wages and social benefits will be out of uh, profound concerns with this model. In addition, work is not only a question of earnings, but create, uh, creates meaning, identity, and social life. Putting employed people on the side track and paying them something like compensation would be a misdirection from our view. Everyone must also have a fair chance in the future to be able to do useful work and get uh, a fair pay. Yes, uh, thank you for, for raising some of the potential challenges around, around UBI and also for, for highlighting the, the way that training workers can be empowering and the link between building, organizing and building worker power along with training and preparing workers. Um, that in conjunction with, with Senator Akberry's thoughts about tying training with benefits uh, show how all of the challenges that we've talked about today are really integrated and part of a, a comprehensive need for building a better future of work, a more equitable future of work, where there is a comprehensive safety net, where there is training and skill development, and where there is uh, a balancing of power between workers and employers. Uh, as we approach the, the close of, of this event and what has been a really uh, rich discussion, uh, I'd like to, to give each panelist an opportunity again. Uh, at the beginning, you all opened by telling us kind of what you see as the, the core challenges facing workers today and into the, the near future. Uh, and to, to end on a bit of a, a practical and optimistic note, I'd like you each to share what you see as one solution uh, that can bring us to a better future of work. It could be a policy solution, it could be an employer practice solution, uh, or a, a worker and, and labor-centered solution. Um, so just, uh, we have a, a couple of minutes left, so if each of you could share what you see as, as one solution you, you hope to see. Uh, Anya, I'll start with you. We need a strong commitment between employees and the firms to, to uh, um, build uh, um, um, possibilities for, for lifetime learning and to, to um, find a solution to, to get the skills you need for the change processes. And that should, should be a strong commitment between both parties. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Anna. Thank you. Um, so many things so hard to just say one, but I want to go cultural here at the end um, as a solution. And well, speaking to most people when it comes to the flexible workplace and where we are today, um, one of the reasons we're not doing it is because of fear, you know, of, of being guilty or, or uh, dropping the ball. And I think we need trust, much more trust, because if someone gets a job, six interviews gets into my company you know you want to do a good job and trust them that they really want to do that uh, less control and more trust because then you can spend the time instead of controlling and monitoring to coach teach skill them etc um so that's my 
uh, my claim for today and I'll trust more, fear less uh, and look to the future. Excellent, thank you. And Roy. I think I'll just offer a personal practical thought, which is whatever we expect working people generally to do, learn new skills, adapt for the future, we who are thinking about it and calling for it should be prepared to do ourselves. So I just challenge each person to think, what's the most different professional skill that you've applied yourself to learning in the last year from what you've done before? And you know, if you're like me and many of us, you'll kind of stroke your chin and think, wait a minute, I've basically been doing the same thing. And maybe I learned some new piece of software. And so I think if we wanna have empathy for what's required in this transition, the transition starts within. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and I think, you know, all of these, all of these solutions have a component of coming together and, and working across stakeholder groups, across ideologies, uh, across oceans, as in this conversation, uh, to, to think about the future we want. Uh, so thank you again to our panelists. Thank you to our audience for participating in this conversation, engaging in these difficult questions. Uh, and, and thank you to our hosts at, at Aspen Germany for, for organizing such a, a wonderful conversation. So thank you all, and I hope you have a, a wonderful evening or morning, depending on where you are. Thank you, Shelley, and everybody for bringing us together.